This morning we're talking about the elephant in a room. That's an old English proverb. And what it means is there's something wrong. And it's so humongous, it's so big, it's like an elephant, but people don't want to acknowledge it. Kind of ignore it. Uh, kind of deny it. And I shared with you this morning, and, and really what the elephant is, I'm going to show you tonight, is sin in the camp. Sin in the house of God. That's one of our big problems. And I know a lot, and it can go along with an unrenewed mind, carnality, flesh. Uh, I've got a lot of scriptures here tonight, I don't think I'm going to get to any of them, where over and over the New Testament says we've got to deal with our flesh. You've got to crucify it, mortify it, you've got to deny it. Pastor Gary said that tonight, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. You've got to deal with your flesh. What separates God from man is sin in our lives. Sin separates us from God. You say, well, Jesus took care of it all. Well, Jesus, uh, he overcame the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, Jesus took uh, our sins, uh, went to the cross. He suffered, died, but why did he come? Uh, it says, he that committeth sin, John said in 1 John, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For this purpose, for this purpose, was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Sin is the work of the devil. There is no sin in heaven. Aren't you glad? And when the new heaven and new earth is come after the thousand year reign of Christ, there will never be sin again. Sin is going to be gone forever. Can you say praise the Lord? And uh, we'll never be tempted, tested, or tried again because we've already proved our love during this time of testing in this earth. But the Bible says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial which is about to try you as though some strange thing has happened. The enemy came to get Adam and his wife to sin in order to turn him into slaves. Romans go, the book of Romans goes on and on. It says, you are a slave to whomever you serve, whether a sin uh, unto death or of righteousness unto eternal life. And, and so I know a lot of preachers are saying, well, when you got born again, all your sins were dealt with past, present, and future. Well, that's just not true. Because like I said, just look up the word flesh in the New Testament, and over and over and over it talks about dealing with your flesh. And sin is in the flesh. And flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so there's an elephant in the room, and it's called sin. And, 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 and what you have to deal with is your sin. Anything that is against the will, the nature, the character, the personality of God, you've got to deal with it. And if you don't deal with it, it won't be dealt with. Uh, it's between you and Jesus. You've got to, like, like the grocery cart illustration, it's, it's in your grocery cart. And when I die, I'm going to push my grocery cart before God, and he's going to take it. He's going to look in, in the cart and say, what's in your cart, Mike? And it better, it better be nothing but the Spirit. Now, we're going to look at the profound words of Jesus tonight, and I really think there's a real lack of understanding that the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ and his teachings. Now, it's not just the teachings of Jesus, it's, it's not just the words of Jesus, but it's the works of Jesus, and it's his life. And I tell people salvation is not just Christ upon the cross, but I believe salvation is from the conception to the resurrection. It's all of the life of Jesus. Eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no zoe in you. It's all of, it's all of Christ. It's not just a small portion of what Christ did. It's all of Christ. Because if Christ had not done what, what was right up to the time that he was betrayed by uh, Judas and he suffered and he was crucified in the cross, if he had not lived the life that he needed to up to that time, his, his death would have meant nothing. If he would not have been sinless, he would have just been another sinner hung on the cross. And the Romans, that, that, was, that was one of their favorite ways of killing people, was to hang him on the cross like they did Christ. But because he was sinless, say sinless. sinless. He was absolutely perfect in every regard. Not for one nanosecond did Jesus ever get out of the will of God. Not one nanosecond. Not with one attitude, one thought, one deed, one word. Everything he did was in perfect, absolute, 100% harmony with the Father. Isn't that amazing? I mean, none of us even get a day. None of us, a lot of us can't even make it maybe an hour with every thought, every emotion, every attitude in line with God's will. But he did 
from the moment he was conceived into the moment he, 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 he said it is finished and he rose again from the dead. Now the good news is that Jesus that overcame the world, the flesh and the devil, he lives in me. And he came, what he come to do? He came to take up residence in me to give me victory over sin. That's what he came to do. He came not to give me a license to continue in sin, not to excuse my sin, not to say, well, I just can't help myself, but to, but to get victory over the flesh, to crucify the flesh. And this is the that victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, our faith in Jesus Christ. You say, well, Pastor Mike, why do we have to talk about sin? It's an unpleasant thing. It is absolutely unpleasant, just like pulling weeds in a garden. Now, I know how many of you grow gardens in in, in the summer, okay? Uh, How many of you get a good harvest in your gardens, okay? So look at that. You know what? One thing you must do, you've got to do, it's not just the plowing and it's not just the planting, not just the fertilizing. It is what? Pulling weeds. It's a daily job, ain't it? You're out there. I bet you're out there as the sun comes up, Brother Gary, and you're just plucking them little buggers out of the, out of the rows, right? You're just separating the good from the bad, and you're pulling the weeds. Listen, that's what our Christian life's got to be like. You've got to be pulling the weeds out of your garden. Bad attitudes, bad thoughts, bad desires, bad ambitions, bad. Uh, I told you last week we had a couple that visited us, and I preached the goodness and the severity of God. I try to do that in every sermon. And the reason why, years and years ago, we had gone through a terrible split, and one day I was back there, and, and, and you know, I used to preach. Uh, uh, I, I would probably, an average, oh, I probably averaged seven, eight, nine, ten sermons a week, if not more, because we had a Bible college. I was doing TV. I had thousands of cassettes, literally. Thousands. I, I have preached, I know, well over 10,000 sermons. I've got over 5,000 outlines. And uh, I was back there one day, and I was looking at these sermons, and, and I was kind of happy with my sermons. And the Lord spoke to my heart very, very strongly. And he said, son, he said, uh, there are sermons. He didn't say... Everything I said was not of him, but he said, they're not really, really, they don't really meet, meet my quality control. I said, Lord, what do you mean by that? He said, son, he said, you didn't preach the goodness and the severity. I said, what? He said, you preached my goodness and my love and my mercy and my kindness, but you, you, you didn't preach the other side of the coin. There's two sides of the coin. He said, th- th- that's all false gospel. I said, what? He said, yeah, you didn't, pre- you didn't warn people. See, you didn't preach the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord. He said to me, that's all false gospel. It blew me away. I took all of my thousands of teachings and I threw them all out. I threw them all out. Now, why would you do something so crazy, Pastor Mike? Because I have the fear of the Lord in me. But listen, Paul said, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let them be what? Cursed. The Greek word says damned. As I said before, so say it now again. If any man preach any other gospel than that we, which we have preached, let them be cursed. See, and, and, and God himself, before man ever committed sin, he preached both sides. He preached his goodness, and it was good, right? All of the garden, you can have all of the fruits, you can eat anything you want. And, but then he talked about the tree of life, and then he talked about the tree of good and the knowledge of good and evil. He said, now let me tell you, Adam. He said, I know you're my son, but you see that tree there, boy? You see that? I'm sure he pointed it out to him. He said, you see that tree? He said, yeah. He said, the day you eat fruit off of that tree, you're dead. I mean, you're separated from me. And how many you know it came to pass? See, but the devil came along and he didn't talk about the fact of the judgment and the punishment and, and, and God's wrath and God's anger against all sin. Now, I told you this morning, people don't understand. He says, I am the Lord and I change not. When all of the judgments of the old covenant against sin, listen to me, and you can read it from Gen- when God kicked them out of the garden. How about the flood? The devil didn't send the flood. God sent the flood. Why did he send the flood? Because of sin. And that God that brought judgment, and in, in the book of, it's, it's, it's one of the epistles of maybe Second Peter, also in the book of Jude, the last thing God's going to do is he's going to what? Instead of sending a flood of water to destroy the earth, he's going to send a fire. He's going to burn up the heavens and the earth. And the book of Revelation is filled from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 19 with nothing but the judgments of God. Nothing but the wrath and the anger of God. 
the, the, the four horses and, 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 and the seven seals and the seven trumpets and, and, and the seven plagues. And I mean, just God's bringing. Now, what, what is he trying to do, though? If you read that very carefully, it, God doesn't want to do this, but he has to do it. You know what he's trying to bring? He's trying to bring people to a place of repentance. He's trying to deal with the elephant in the room. And, and in the days of Jeremiah, it became so full of sin, but they, they, they didn't even acknowledge the elephant in the room. They didn't want to deal with their adultery and their covetousness and, and their fleshliness and their lying and their stealing and all of the immorality they did. Now, in the old co- now God's attitude towards sin in the old covenant is still the same attitude he has in the new covenant. God hates sin. And, and, and But the good news is he's given us, in the old covenant, there was no remedy except the looking forward to, in, in faith, to the coming Messiah. But now we've got Jesus, don't we? We can be born again. We can be born again. I'm telling you, uh, Peter, the very first sermon he said, he said, repent and be converted. There is no conversion without repentance, people. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who think they've been converted and they're not converted. You got to repent. That means you got to acknowledge it, God. Uh, if it's wrong, I don't want it in my life. And of course, we, we know there. And people say, "Well, you know, all sin is the same." No, not all sin is the same. Anything that is not a faith is sin. Is that not right? That's correct, isn't it? Anything that is not a faith is sin. But how many know there are sins, according to what Paul said in Romans chapter, I mean, in Galatians chapter 5, that will damn your soul. They that do such things shall not inherit eternal life. So that couple, they heard my sermon last Sunday, and they were standing back there. I went back, talked to them, and they said this to me. They said, you know, we've gone to church after church after church, and we could not find anybody who's preaching what you're preaching. They were not, pre- they said, if we lived up here, we'd be here every service, basically. They said, I said, what? I said that nobody's telling Christians that if you got sin in your life, you better deal with it. And, um, and, and, and I said, well, how many churches did you go to? And they said, we visited Pentecostal churches because they're Pentecostal people. They said we went to 32 churches. So today when I put my video up on Facebook, I just, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, sin is the elephant in the room, this this guy came back and he said, you know, uh, Brother Mike, he said, I've been going to the same Pentecostal church for three years now. He said, in three years time, he said, I've never even heard the word sin mentioned. Never heard it mentioned. He said, then we had a guest speaker and he did mention sin in his sermon one time. But when he got done preaching, listen, he apologized for talking about it. That's what the guy said to me. He apologized for bringing up the subject to sin. We well, understand the reason why. Because if you think that all your sins are forgiven past, present, and future, it's a done deal. Let's just go on living however we want to live. But God doesn't wink at it. God's got to deal with it. And it says, uh, give no place to the devil. And that's really why a lot of Christians are going through a lot of problems is because we've opened the door. We've all opened the door to the devil. If anybody says he's sin, it's not. He's a liar and he doesn't understand the truth. Now, Jesus in John chapter eight, and, and we, I wish we could really cover all of this tonight, but we just can't. The words of Jesus are so profound. They are so mind boggling. And I think it's a shame we don't preach a lot what Jesus said in a modern day church. Well, I love the epistles. I love the in him realities. Uh, I mean, I love all of that. But what Jesus said was so profound. But see, Jesus is in the spirit. He said, the words I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. Uh, But you're going to see the people he's dealing with are in the flesh. Now, how many know spirit and flesh don't get along together? That's what it says in Galatians. It says that the spirit lusteth against the flesh, lusteth against the spirit, and spirit against the flesh, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Flesh and spirit doesn't get along together. As a matter of fact, in Galatians, it gives us some examples of the flesh because it talks about how you know, uh, you know, Esau. And, 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 and Isaac, and it talks about uh, Cain and Abel. And, you know, Cain rose up and killed Abel. See? Uh, the flesh hates the things of the spirit. And uh, so Jesus, he, he loves these people now. And, and what he's come to do now is he, he hasn't come 
to, uh, to start a club or a clique or did they, to get people joined up with them. No, Jesus came to do something radical. He came to what I, I call it, do a heart transplant. Jesus wants to do a heart transplant in he, these people. Now, remember, these are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the people who have kept the laws and the customs and the feast days, the holy days, that kept the sacrifices all of these thousands of years. And these people, have, because they, they, they've done all of these things that Moses said, and of course, they didn't keep all of what Moses said. They couldn't. It was impossible. The law wasn't given to convert your heart. The law was a schoolmaster to keep us into Christ came, and also the law was given given to reveal sin. Did you know that? That's what it says. The law came to reveal that we're sinners. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the nation of Israel, they were full of pride. See, they were relig- They were the most religious group of people you can imagine. And God gave them the law through Moses and he did mighty signs and wonders and miracles. But see, Jesus now comes because he's got to do something which nobody really wants to do. He wants to reveal to the people that they are utterly, completely, totally lost and undone without him. They have no hope without him. None. They need to be converted. They need a new heart. They need a new nature. They need to have a heart transplant. How many know a heart transplant is really radical? It's radical. And, and, and so, and actually, I won't get into it, but circumcision to a certain extent is an illustration of that. I cannot imagine that God says to Abraham, now, Abraham, I want you to circumcise yourself. That's the cutting away of the flesh of the most private part in a man's life, right? Take a knife, no, 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 no uh, uh, painkiller, nothing. Take a knife. I want you to cut away your flesh. And you got to do this because if you don't, you don't have a covenant with me. And then he says to him, now, you got to do Isaac. And notice it it says a child, it should be done when when they're eight days old. You know why? Because if you cut away the flesh of a child before he gets too old, he won't have to go through all of the hell and pain you went through. So my children, because I raised them up in the way they should go, they haven't had to go through a lot of the pain and the sufferings I went through that when I turned 19 years old, I circumcised my flesh. Now, it's not a circumcision of your flesh. It's a circumcision of your heart. He says, who is, who, who is the true Jew? One who's not circumcised in the flesh, but circumcised in the heart. God wants you to circumcise your heart. The God says, cut away the flesh. That's your job. And then he said to Abraham, now you got 300 men servants. How many of you guys would like that job? Come here, John. Come here, Joe. Come here, Fred. Come here, Bob. Come here. You know, and he had all these men come and he had the nasty, dirty job of having these men standing there. I'm just, come on, let's be honest. Let's just uh, drop the drawers, Fred. And he had to grab that guy in the most private part of his life. And he had to cut away the flesh. Who wants that kind of job? I don't want that kind of job. But you know what? That's what pastors are called to do. We're called to take the word of God and say, okay, we're going to have to get down to the nitty gritty of the dirty, the ugly, the nasty. And it's time for you to cut away your flesh. Because if you don't circumcise your flesh, you have nothing to do with Christ. I don't care if you were born in the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You don't circumcise your flesh. You have nothing to do with Christ. God said, cut it off. Amen? Is that good or what? Okay, so John chapter 8, now Jesus is going to say spiritual things, and they're not going to like it. As a matter of fact, when you get to the end of John chapter 8, because in the very beginning he says, that's why you want to kill me, that's why you want to kill me, that's why you want to kill me, and and, and the reason, because, see, they said, you you got a devil. Jesus, you got a devil. What do you mean we want to kill you? He knew their heart. He knew the minute he was going to begin to deal with their sinful nature, the pride, the ego, the lust, the ungodliness, the meism. He, he, they knew the minute that, and you know, I've learned that as, as a landlord because I, I, I rent to a lot of men through the years and I just had to put a man out this week. I had to put a man out two weeks ago, you know. He threatened to beat me up, you know. I wasn't moved by it. 
You know, cussing, swearing, putting his fist in my face. I wasn't moved by that, you know. But, but I know when I'm dealing with these worldly men who don't know Christ, who have no idea who Christ is, they're going to rise up in the flesh and they're going to threaten to hurt me, do me harm, shut me down. He said, I'm going to shut down their church. I said, well, I said, go ahead. And I said, many people have told me that through the years, but see what you can do, you know. And, and, and I've had, I had to put them out. I had to put a guy out yesterday. I know when you say no to the flesh... The flesh will rise up. No, you're not doing that. That's done. That's over with. But we ought to start it when our children are little. Instead of let them get full of that spirit of rebellion, it's the flesh. And it just rises up and it up against us. But Jesus, he he said unto them in verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall what? Not walk in darkness. Now there's a statement. It's true. It's profound, profound. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. He said what he meant. He meant what he said. He said, if you are, if you are following Jesus, you aren't going to be living in the darkness of your flesh. You're going to walk in the light as he is in the light. But shall have the light of life. You're going to enjoy that type of freedom. Now, we don't have time to get into everything he said here. And you're going to have to go ahead and you're going to have to study that yourself. But verse 23, and Jesus said unto them, listen now, he's talking to the seed of Abraham. Now, it sounds like these are fighting words. And they are. But you understand the sincerity of Jesus is to rescue them. He wants to rescue them. And in order to rescue them, he's got to get them to face the reality that they're not who they think they are. That they're not lily white, perfect people. That they are far from where they need to be. And the only one who can get them to be where they need to be is Jesus Christ. And so he says to them, listen, you are from beneath. Was he telling the truth? Yeah, he said, and I'm from above. He said, you are of this world. I'm not of this world. Did you know Jesus came to turn us into aliens? I tell people, people say, do you believe in aliens, Pastor Mike? I said, yeah, I'm one of them. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm a stranger. I'm a pilgrim. You know, I have spiritual antennas sticking up. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, or Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Set your affections on things above and not on things below. That's what it says. When Christ who is our life shall appear, you shall also appear with him in glory. So that means as Christians, we, well, I'm, I'm, we're going to have material things, but we're not going to be materialistic. We're not going to be covetous. Not going to be greedy. We're not going to be, you know. But look at what it goes on to say here. You are from beneath. I'm from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall, listen, you shall die in your what? Your sins. He's talking about sins. Jesus came to deal with sins. Remember Jesus says to the man who was laying on the cot, they lowered him through the ceiling. He said, be a good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Notice he dealt with sins first. The physical aspect of salvation is wonderful by his stripes you were healed and of course they said who are you to forgive sins and he says listen he, what did he say matter of fact did you know john chapter 8 began with the woman caught in adultery john chapter 8 began with that and of course the religious people want to kill the woman in her sin she was caught in adultery where's the guy where's the guy i mean they caught him and her together where's the guy See, they let the guy get away, but they're going to kill that woman. And Jesus, of course, said, OK, at least they had enough common sense to know they weren't sinless. He said, OK, you that are without sin, you, you go and I heard a well. I won't tell you who it is. A well, years and years and years ago that I stopped listening to him. I don't know if he believes the same thing. If I named this name, everybody in this room would know him. He said this. He said, when I got born again, I was rushed in the blood. I was cleansed. He said this. He said, I could have taken the place of Jesus on the cross because I was sinless at that moment. That is nothing but pure rubbish. Rubbish. And, and, and I, I just hope he doesn't still believe that to this day. That is pure rubbish. Only Jesus could have taken our sins. 
No human being can even take one of your sins. Only Jesus Christ could take your sins. And he, he, and, and he said, then he, uh, and, and he, of course he said to the woman, after they all walked away, from the eldest to the youngest, he said, where's your accusers? He said, Lord, there is none. He said, I, I don't accuse you either. So I want you to notice, as we're dealing with sin tonight, uh, I'm not here to accuse anybody. Because the minute I point my finger at you, I, I've, got, I've got fingers pointing back at me. So it's not about that. It's just me dealing with whatever is wrong in my life. And the minute you make an excuse for whatever attitude you have that is against the will of God, the minute you have an excuse for whatever you're watching, you shouldn't be watching, the minute you make an excuse on whatever you do that is against the will of God, the Holy Spirit no longer can convict you in that area. You've just justified yourself and you hardened your heart. Okay, and, and so he said, go and sin no more. Then isn't that what he told the lady? Go and do what? Sin no more. So in the old covenant, if God said, stop your sinning in the old covenant, now that we got Christ within us, now that we've got the Holy Spirit, now that we've got the word completed. Now we've got a new covenant. We don't have no excuse for sin. As a matter of fact, Hebrews says that if you continue in sin, you're treading afresh upon the blood of Christ. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture that says if somebody gets born again and they begin to walk with God and then they turn their back on God, it would have been better if, if they had never been born. The judgment of people who have been converted and go back to the world is way worse than the judgment of sinners who have known, never known Christ. Are we telling people this? We ought to be telling people this. I've got good friends of mine, preachers' friends. I, I just the other day, I'm not picking them. About maybe five months ago, I, uh, uh, I go on Facebook, and, and it's amazing. People will broadcast their iniquity over Facebook. And this pastor I've known, I've known this pastor for 30-some years. Here, he just up and left his wife. I'm not picking on him. But his wife is born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. His kids are all grown up. His wife is on Facebook, just broken, broken, just my husband left me. He, he was a local pastor, left me. And, and, and now he's with another woman, and he shows, he, he, he's, he, he's, he calls this new woman his, his love. She's the love of my life, right? And he's got her and his picture, videos and pictures on his Facebook, broadcasting uh, just, just an open sin. And his wife, her heart is totally shattered and broken. Now, I'm not judging this guy. I'm just saying this is what the modern day gospel has done to us. It's, it's ripped the fear of the Lord out of people's hearts. And he was, so, uh, and, and, and I know this pastor, and he, he had, he had a, a link to a video about a preacher. I clicked on the video. Well, here I thought, well, I've seen this video before because this guy's preaching what we call lascivious grace. It, it's beyond Calvinism. It's, it's called antinomianism. It, it's it's just, just like you can do whatever you want. It's, you're good to go. Jesus paid the price. Your sins are forgiven. And I looked down through the comments, and there I saw a comment from Pastor Mike Yeager warning this preacher Saying, listen, brother, man, you have missed the boat and you need to repent for your false doctrines because you're sending people to hell, telling them they can go to heaven living like the devil. And, there, and now, now that pastor had to see my comment because it was right there. But yet away he goes. See, because what does the devil do? He comes to steal, kill and destroy. And how does he do it? He steals away from us the reality of God's attitude towards sin. Yep. So uh, let's look, look what Jesus said here now um, in verse 24. And I said, therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for you believe not that I am he. You shall die in your sins. Then they said unto him, who art thou? And Jesus said, now uh, you can hear the attitude. Who do you think you are? Even the same that I said unto you before from the beginning. I have many things to say to you. Uh, 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 to, I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. He's only saying what the father tells him to say. 
They understood not that he spake of them to, of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up now, see, so, so this whole chapter 8, he knows these people are not ready to receive correction. He knows they're not ready to repent. He knows they don't have a revelation of how wicked and how lost and undone they are. And that we're all lost and undone. We all have sinned. We all have come short of the glory of God. There's none perfect, not one. We all need saving. But see, you need to know that you're, you need saving. So a, a man or a woman goes to the hospital. They, they, their chest is hurting to where they feel like they're going to pass out. Uh, body's full of pain. They go in. The doctor, he begins to examine him. He comes back and says, I'm sorry, you've got a terrible heart disease. And the only solution is you need to have a new heart. Now, if that doctor believes, if that patient believes that doctor, he, what, what is a, when a person sees their life has come to the end and their only hope is a doctor, they put their whole life into that doctor's hands, don't they? You need a heart transplant. Your heart is shot. We got to put a new heart in you. You're not going to make it. You won't survive another six months. Doc, what do I need to do? Well, First of all, do you have insurance? Yeah, whatever. Doc, whatever it takes. I don't want to die. I'm not ready to die yet. Doc, whatever it takes. I'll do whatever you have to say. They completely give themselves over to that medical profession because the doctor came back with a diagnosis. Your heart is diseased and you need a new heart. But that doctor had to get that person to understand you're not going to live. You're not going to survive. You're not going to make it in the condition you're in. So what are we supposed to do as preachers? We're supposed to let people know you ain't going to make it without Jesus. You got to surrender everything to him. Now, I was, I was used to, I said, when I married my wife and she said, I do and I do, and she had some uh, men chasing her, you know what, and, and, and I had some girls chasing me, but we, without even saying it, we both understood this, that she wasn't going to share me with nobody else, and I'm not sharing her with anybody else. And God don't want to share you with anybody else. You belong to him. You are his property. He bought you by his blood. You have been ransomed and redeemed. Amen. And so he wants all of you, or he don't want none of you. I said he wants all of us or none of us. And it's because we have this half-hearted, I'm going to call it lukewarm. What did Jesus say in John? Now, I'm not mad at anybody, so when I preach like this, don't think I'm mad at anybody. I'm not talking to Mike Yeager, you know. And, and he says, uh, because, you, you are not, because you are neither cold nor hot, but because you're lukewarm, I will. Jesus said, I will. Jesus said, Je- say Jesus said, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I'm full, I'm rich, and I have need of nothing. And he says, you know not, you do not understand. You're blind, naked, destitute. You're lost. Talking to the church. I think that's a perfect description of the Laodicean church of our age, don't you? Uh, And he says, I got a lot of things to say to you. I I just can't say it to you right now. But the day will come when I'm lifted up. Then shall you know that I'm he and and that I do nothing of myself. But as the father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that are pleasing to him. Now, that's where God's that's 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 the uh, uh, bullseye we're aiming for. I only do those things that are pleasing to the father. That's where we're headed. Do we fall short of it? Yeah, but we keep aiming for it. I only do those things. I treat my wife according to how the father wants me to treat my wife. Not according to how my flesh wants to, but how my father wants me to. I treat you according to how I believe the father wants me to treat you. Um, I treat these men that I deal with all the time according to how I believe the father wants me to treat them. It's never been about money. It's always been about how can I reach them? How can I help them? How many know that you can't help somebody who don't want no help, but you can pray for them? You can still give them the word. But Jesus goes on, and we'll get into a lot more deeper detail here right before we quit. Then said Jesus to those Jews, which, now listen, he's talking to the, the Jews now that have believed everything he said. Now, a lot of these rascals didn't, but now he's talking to people who really believe what he said. But watch what he does to these people who say, he knows they believe what he said. But notice what he does. He, 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 he goes in, and, 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 and he, he just... Uh, uh, with truth, he just pulls back the veil. He pulls back the drapes. Listen to what he said. If you continue in my word, then what? 
You are my disciples indeed. If you stay in my Bible, my word, my, that I have spoken, then you are my disciples. Now, if you don't stay in his word, you're not one of his disciples. Would you agree with that? Yes. If you stay in the word, if you abide in me, my word abides in you. If a man does not abide in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. If men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Notice what he says. And you shall know the what? Truth and the truth will make you free. Now, the, the truth he's talking about here is, is the numerous things. Number one, that you know he's the only way to the Father. He's the only solution to your sinful nature. He's the only one that can rescue you. The second thing is you'll know the truth of what you really are without him. And then you will abhor yourself. Yeah, yeah, you will abhor yourself. There ain't nothing good in Mike Yeager but Jesus Christ. So when you recognize there's nothing good in you and people begin to verbally assault you or attack you or demean you and put you down, you know what your response is? You're right. You're right. Without Jesus, I'm a mess. I've had many times people accused me and I said, well, you don't know half of it. They said, what? I said, read my book. I need God because I'm stupid. I said, I'm, there ain't nothing good in me. I said, the only thing good in me is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not just speaking some religious jargon here. Do you believe that? Do you believe there's nothing good in you but Jesus? We have these treasures and earthen vessels that the excellence of the glory may be of God and not of us. Who commanded light to shine out our darkness has shined in our hearts. So the only thing good in me, that's why when Jesus said, I was hungry, I was naked, I was in prison, I was sick, you were there for me. And we're going to say this. Yeah, you're right, Lord. I was Johnny on the spot. No, they can say, Lord, when did I do these things? He said, when you did it to the least of my brethren. You know who was helping those people? It wasn't you. It was Jesus in you. <laughs> so you're not patting yourself on the back. You're going, Jesus, you're wonderful. Because I was never, I, 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 I didn't love anybody. I hated myself. But the love of God was shed abroad in my heart when the Holy Ghost came in. And I started loving people I would have never loved. You know why? It was Jesus in me, the hope of glory. You getting something out of this tonight? And so now he's going to talk to the people who believed on him. They answered him and, and, uh, he, they, and he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Free from yourself, free from your flesh, free from sin, free from pride, free from arrogance, free from a lot of nasty, wicked, yucky stuff. And he says, and the answer is that we be Abraham's seed. Now here's the flesh. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free. Listen, verse 34, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I send you. Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. You're involved in sin, you're a slave. You're a slave. The devil's got you by the throat. You're a puppet on five strings. Listen. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. That means, he says, I, I know you got sin. He said, but I ain't going to put up with it forever. Now, you got sin. The devil's manipulating, controlling you, and I'm not going to put up with it forever. You know, we, we even as grown-ups, you know, I'll go, I'll put up with people for so long, and then I'll be praying about it, and the time comes. I said, well, you've crossed the line. Pete and I just had to deal with a man. We helped that man three times, didn't we, Pete? And uh, things were going on. I dealt with him. He wasn't honest. He wasn't sincere. He called up Pete because he's trying to manipulate. See, people in the flesh want to manipulate. So basically, he took Pete out. Did he feed you for that, or did you feed him, Pete? He fed you, and we know he doesn't do that kind of stuff. So it took Pete out, and what he was doing, but see, Pete and I are in total harmony with Jesus. We're in agreement. We didn't even really discuss this before he took him out. And so he takes Pete out, but Peter, by the, new, by the Spirit, knew this man was trying to turn him against me. But guess what? Peter told him, he said, listen, as a church, we deal with men of, uh, to a certain, he said, there's an invisible line that they cross, and when they cross that line, we're done with him. And that's what I had told the guy. I said, you crossed the line. 
I said, I gave you chance after chance after chance, I said, but, you know, I don't see no repentance there. I see no humility there. I see no brokenness there, uh, just basically arrogance and then conniving and manipulating, you know. And, and, and so God will put up with us for so long. And then God said, that's enough. And if you ever get to that place where you knew if you went any further, you were a goner. I did. I backslid as a Christian for a little while. I knew that I knew that if I went any more farther away from God, that I was dead. The devil would come and take me over, and I would never come back. And I have many friends through the years, I hate to tell you this, who were even pastors. I've seen them cross that line, and they've never come back. I'm not saying God isn't still knocking on our door, but they harden their heart through the deceitfulness of sin. Notice, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. So now he knows what's in their heart. And, 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 and because my word hath no place in you, notice what makes the difference. God's word in your heart. What's going to make the difference? God's word. You know how many people I know that confess to know that to be Christians and they've not memorized any scriptures. They spend very little time. I'm not talking about listening to preachers on TV. That's not spending time in the word. You get into the word and get the word in you. David said, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You, you know, I know we got to spoon feed you. You know, here, open up your mouth. Here it goes. Here it comes. But you know what? There comes a time when you got to pick up your spoon yourself. I know little Serafina. She's only a year old uh, this coming week. And she, she don't want nobody to feed her. She wants to, she wants to feed herself. She'll grab that spoon and stick it in her mouth, you know. And then she'll want to stick the food in my mouth. You know, she'll chew it up real good, pull it out, and then, ooh, 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 ooh. Well, I'm sorry, Seraphina, I'm not taking that, you know. But notice, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father. You do that which you have seen of your father. Now, here we're going to get serious. The answer is said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto him, if you were Abraham's children, I mean, children of faith, you would do the works of Abraham. What did Abraham do? He obeyed God. God said, come out of the city of the Chaldeans." He came out. God said, circumcise. He circumcised. God, God told Abraham what to do. And guess what Abraham did? Yes, sir. Faith without works is dead. Saving faith. I have a book back there called The Works That Saves. Because faith that produces works is what brings salvation. Not works without faith. There's a works without faith. I'm talking a faith that produces works. I'll give you. Well, all tonight, you coming to church on a Sunday night, Super Bowl night, that is an act of faith. You came out, sat here, and listened to me. You already heard me go on for an hour this morning. Broke my own rule for 45 minutes. I'll break it again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not very, hopefully not very long, but still, you came out when you lifted your hand as an act of faith. When you began to praise God, let everything that breath, hath breath do what? Praise, praise the Lord. The dead praise not the Lord. The dead praise not the Lord. People with dead faith, they won't praise God. They won't worship God. Look what it goes on to say here. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. For, uh, uh, heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Now listen, remember heart surgery here. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now I think they knew the, the gossip had already gone around that Joseph was not the uh, biological father of Jesus. So they're basically saying, your mother, see what the flesh does? I know what your mother did. Your mother had a relationship with another man, but we know who our father is. Isn't that what the flesh does? The minute the flesh begins to be exposed, it rises up in anger frustration, bitterness, and it begins to attack the person who is presenting truth. Every prophet that has ever died never died because they said, God loves you. You're peaches and cream. You're the cream of the crop. You are so valuable. Now, I'm not saying we're not valuable and precious to God. I'm just saying 
that false prophets, all they do is heap praise on you. And them guys, they don't, they, they don't, they don't kill those guys. They fill their pockets. They support them. They, they, they get behind them. But uh, uh, Jeremiah, they want, they, you know what? Prophet after prophet, they murdered. Jesus said, matter of fact, he said, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou which killest the prophets. <laughs> then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even, uh, uh, even uh, one father, even God. Now, is it not notice the hypocrisy here? They killed Jesus because he said God was his father. And guess what they just did? They said, God is our father. No, I'm telling you, they killed Jesus because he said God was his father. But right here, they just said God is our father. So how does that work? How, how come you're going to kill Jesus because he declared God is his father? And, but you can declare you're his father, right? Jesus, this is in verse 41. We be not born of fornication, for you have one father, even God. Jesus said unto him, if God were your father, you would what? Love me. Listen, these are all powerful truths. If God is your real spiritual father, you will love Jesus. You will love him. Okay, for I proceed forth and came from God. Now there came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my words. Listen, verse 44. Now this, this, this is to all of us before we got born again. You are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Who did he murder? He murdered the truth. He snuffed out the light. And actually, he murdered a third of the angelic host, didn't he? The minute he got those angels to follow him in his rebellion, they were all cut off from God. They're dead angels. In the eyes of God, they're dead. Notice, he, he was a murderer from the beginning, he abode not in truth, because the truth is not in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of it his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now listen, I'm not judging no preacher's hearts. I'm not judging it. But if you got a preacher in the pulpit telling you that you can live any way you want, and they don't share the fear of the Lord, and they don't warn people, Who's her father? Because the devil lied to the woman. Said you can eat of that fruit and you'll go to heaven. You can disobey God and go to heaven. He's the savior of all them that obey him. That's what the Bible says. Jesus is the savior of all them that obey him. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convicted me of sin? No, notice sin, sin, sin. It's the elephant in the room. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Now he's talking to the Jews that believed him. Then answered the Jews and said, notice here's the flesh unto him. Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and you have a devil. Notice you're a Samaritan because remember now they must know that Joseph was not because Joseph was of the line of the tribe of Judah. They must know that Joseph was not the biological uh, father of Jesus. And so they're very Figuring that Mary had a relationship with the Samaritan. And so now they're calling him a Samaritan. Notice what the flesh does. Now, what is Jesus saying? You say, Jesus was speaking so harsh, Pastor Mike. No, it was love talking. Love was trying to tell these people, you are in deep, deep trouble. You are separated from God. And I am your only solution. I'm your only answer. You can't get to heaven. You can't be forgiven of your sins. Your nature cannot be converted without surrendering, submitting, following, loving, and obeying me and my word. Period. It's the only, you got to have a blood, not just a heart trans, a transplant, but you got to have blood transfusion. You got to surrender the, to, to, to Christ. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? So love is talking to these people. He said, your father is of the devil. 
So we tell sinners, God loves you just the way you are. No, we need to tell sinners, listen, man, I've told many times, uh, most times, I don't get a lot of sinners mad at me because I, I don't preach this in a haughty, self-righteous attitude. I tell them, I say, let me tell you where I came from and let me let you know where you're at. Nothing good in us. I'm good, I'm good. No, you're not. Nothing good in us. You are hopelessly lost. You are undone. You are cut off from God. And the only one that's going to rescue you and pull your hide out of the fire is Jesus Christ. As you submit to him. Okay. The, the Jew said, oh, you got a devil. Jesus said, I have not a devil, but I honor my father and you do dishonor me. I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and, and judges. Verily, verily, I to you, I, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Now he's talking about being separated from the father. Let's jump down here uh, in, in um, verse 54 as we get ready to close. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I have known him, for I, have say, I, say on, for I should say I know him not. For, and if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his sayings. Now listen, he's saying these people are liars. How are they lying? They say they know God, but they don't know God. They're liars. You know how many liars I run into that they say they know Jesus and they don't know Jesus? Well, how do you know if they know Jesus? Come on. How many of you know that when you get around somebody who knows Jesus, it doesn't take very long for you to know they know Jesus? Isn't this right? So here you've got people who confess to know Christ, but they're lying to themselves. See, and, 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 and that's why it says, be doers of the word, not hearers, only deceiving your own selves. So they're liars. Jesus said, say, Jesus said, he said, they're liars. And yet in verse 55, yet ye have not known him, but I have known him. And I should say, I know him not. I should be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his, I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and you saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and has, uh, uh, and, and has thou seen Abraham? Jesus said, Listen, verily, verily, I'm telling you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> he just told him, he said, I am. You know, uh, Moses, they knew that terminology, because when Moses said, uh, in the fire, when the voice of God was, well, go to Egypt, deliver my people. He said, who should I, what should I say? Tell them I am that I am has sent you. So he just declared I am. Now notice what he goes on to say. Then said they took up stones, notice, to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and, and, and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Those words of Jesus are still just as real today as when he spoke them 2,000 years ago. Just as real. Matter of fact, Jesus said this, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. But Pastor Mike, you mean to tell me that if a person doesn't really know their true spiritual condition, they will never completely, totally yield and surrender themselves to God? That's right. They never will. If, you, if, you, if, if your salvation has not been based on, upon the fact of how lost you really are, you will never really appreciate what Jesus did, and you will never completely yield yourself to him. I know we need a revelation of who we are in Christ, but the first revelation we must have is a revelation of who we are without Christ. I'm telling you, people, you don't hear this. We've got to have a revelation of who we are without Christ. And that will cause you to cling to him and cleave to him. Like the, the, uh, the woman who had the devils Jesus cast out, and she broke open the alabaster box and poured it over Jesus. And the Pharisee, religious, who invited Jesus into his house, he, he's sitting there and he's critical of the woman who is so passionate for Jesus to where she's weeping and crying and wiping. I've got a book back there called Eternally Grateful eternally grateful because see we're missing that in the church today 
People think they're doing God a favor by coming to church Sunday morning. You're not doing God a favor. They think they're doing God a favor by putting a couple dollars in the offering basket. You are deceived. We have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus. He has a right to every thought, every word, every deed, every decision I make. And the church has got to get on the other side of this deception. We got to get out of this deception to where we can just give God just, you know, just enough. No, all we have belongs to him. Can I hear a big amen? 